Good evening to you. I'm Michael Miano, pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church and director of the Power of Preterism Network. And this is our hour of power that we mark out each Thursday evening, 6.30 p.m. I'm always privileged to be joined by my co-host, Edward Howell, who uh, will introduce himself here in a moment. And tonight we have a special guest joining with us. We have Ivan. Ivan, I'm sorry, I did not get your last name. However, I will allow uh, Ivan to have his own moment to introduce himself. I was blessed by a presentation last night that I had heard from him and Edward and I had planned on talking about it tonight and Ivan uh, so graciously decided to join with us. So Edward, I'm gonna hand it over to you if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. And then as I mentioned, Ivan will invite you to follow. And then Ivan, if you so choose, uh, please lead us in a word of prayer. So Edward, please go ahead, brother. Amen. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, and it's always been an honor and a privilege to co-host with Pastor Michael Miano. And it's a wonderful privilege to have our guest Ivan with us this evening. And prayerfully, you know, we'll all be edified, and we will. Uh, Ivan will not be a stranger, and will come again. Amen. You know? Amen. Ivan, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Pastor. Hi, this is Ivan, Ivan Raj, and I was born and raised in India. And uh, I've been uh, walking with the Lord. This, when I say walking with the Lord, I've sur surrendered my life to Christ uh, for the last almost a decade now. And uh, thank you, Pastor Mike, for joining our presentation last night. And also, thank you for inviting me for your presentation this evening. Happy to be part of this. Amen. Uh, thank you, Ivan. As you extended so graciously, graciously to me last night, opening in a word of prayer, do you mind doing the same for us? Absolutely. Great. That's right. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity. Thank you for the technology. In spite of many impediments, uh, we are able to come together and also look into your word and discuss from your word. We invite you to lead us in our discussion, Father. Forgive us of all our sins and cover us under your robe of righteousness. And please be with each of us, especially with uh, Pastor Mike, as he leads, leads us this evening. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. 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 Edward, first thing I have to say, brother, is thank you for uh, being gracious and allowing me to kind of get this off my chest. As I mentioned, I was excited about the presentation last night, and I, uh, I looked forward to using our time today to kind of jump in on some of the things that I had thought about. So thank you. And uh, as you know, I sent you an outline uh, of some of the things I hope to kind of mark out. And uh, the first thing was identifying Babylon. The second part of it was uh, talking about the end times. And then you have, uh, we'll kind of close out and talking about the things that we think are very important, obviously highlighting uh, the power of preterism and resources that we feel are beneficial. Now, uh, one of the things I thought would be good for tonight was rather than marking this out, this is not a debate, I'm sure each of us know how uh, impossible it would be to go about a debate in an hour over uh, half the things that we read in the Bible. Uh, so again, that's not the goal tonight. And even as I had mentioned last night, when I was so uh, graciously welcomed into uh, a woman's home, I said, you know, my, I know that I disagree with some of the things that might be taught here. However, my goal, as I, especially as I've been continuing to read the Gospel of Mark, uh, my goal is to always walk in humility and disagree well uh, when you know that you disagree with people. And I believe that's a, a characteristic of the spirit of God. So, uh, you know, again, I, I was very blessed last night and I look forward to kind of just jumping into some of these things. So uh, the first text that was brought up was Daniel chapter five. And uh, Edward, you know this, uh, that for me, Daniel chapter five has been Daniel, the book of Daniel in its fullness is a book that I've regularly admitted I have not done the study through that I would like to. I believe it's a very rich book, full of history, full of uh, necessary cultural background. And uh, what I had thought was that Ivan did a great job outlining the foundation of what Daniel 5 was getting at. Uh, he had marked out that uh, Babylon stole the vessels of God, uh, ultimately through the invasion there in 586, uh, that they uh, exalted themselves above God, obviously defying the people of God and invading them. Uh, they, uh, and, and I, I appreciated this uh, reflection upon the drinking of the wine, which again was this, uh, this picture of persecution of, uh, you know, they were so, they did this, in, they were, they were constant drunk people. And we see that uh, highlighted all throughout the Old Testament as a picture of idolatry. That's what the idol worshipers would do 
would, uh, you know, those that were against God would be caught up in the drunkenness uh, of whatever it was, whether their idolatry, their stubbornness, or Edward, to use a word that we've been uh, kind of highlighting lately, their hubris, right? That their their uh, their arrogance within themselves, and uh, then ultimately, due to this, Babylon fell. And, you know, we see this kind of all throughout history. And I thought that was a great outline for uh, identifying Babylon in history, right? Understanding history, uh, the, the region of Babylon and what ultimately happened uh, to Babylon because they had that hubris, that, that defiance of God and, and ultimately came against the people of God. So the next text that was brought up was Revelation chapter 14 and also 17 through 19. Uh, these being texts that talk about Babylon. And if you don't mind, uh, let's go ahead and read uh, Revelation chapter 14. And again, this is, uh, as Ivan knows full well, this would be a lot to cover in an hour. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping to kind of just offer up some precipitatory thoughts. And depending on our conversation, uh, we might revisit it. Uh, we might feel that it's something uh, worthy of further investigation. So pardon me one moment. Uh, Revelation 14. Edward, if you're there, if you want to go ahead and read uh, verses 6 through, let's say 6 through 13. Okay. The proclamation of the three angels. There I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel uh, followed saying, Babylon has fallen, is fallen, that uh, great city because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The third angel, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any worships, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on, the, on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out uh, full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of, his, of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of the torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the, uh, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead, who die in the Lord from now on, yes, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Amen. Thank you, Edward. So uh, what we see here, again, as you marked out uh, in the reading, we see three angels. We see the proclamation of these three angels. And what I, I believe uh, Ivan was placing a lot of emphasis upon was that, again, we see here the eternal gospel. And uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I believe that well, the reason why I wanted you to read through that text is what we just read in those few passages are things that contemporary Christians often allude to, but have no idea or never even have read the text themselves. So uh, I appreciate just kind of reading through that text. Uh, obviously, we see the mark of the beast being mentioned, and I'm sure each of us, uh, everybody on this call, everybody watching through social media has heard a host of different interpretations in regards to uh, who the, the, what the mark of the beast might be. Um, then we, we see here the eternal gospel, something that I regularly reference to, uh, the eternality of the gospel. Uh, then we see also the fall of Babylon. And uh, was there anything that stood out to you, Edward, that you feel that uh, people often refer back to that's very popular in this text? Well, I have here in the gospel being preached to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, um, okay, and his judgment, you know, has come, you know, and, you know, the worship him who made the heaven and the earth and spring of water. Um, basically, the waters, you know, um, as I have here in other scripture verses, normally refer to the other nations, tongues, and peoples, you know, and 
as far as uh, Babylon falling, you know, because of the idolatrous uh, behaviors and worships and faith in their beliefs, you know, in themselves and things of this nature. And um, as far as the mark of the beast, this is where I may, may need to be stand, need to stand, be stood corrected. Is I, I see it as though the mark of the beast is accepting the, um, the whoredom and the idolatrous of this beast, you know, accepting their, the lifestyle instead of the life that God has um, presented to the people. Amen. You know? Well said. Absolutely. You see it there, drinking the wine of her adulteries. That's, you know, that's the point there. So, uh, you know, I appreciated that we marked that out there. And this is an important text. You know, uh, one thing, Edward, you know that I've taught on Revelation quite a bit. I actually have a study resource, Clarity in Revelation, uh, that you could go ahead and find on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, etc. And then I also was a part of a conference, ironically, uh, that uh, I had to pre prepare a presentation on one of the books of Revelation. It, is at, it has now, that conference has now become a book called Spirit and Life Lectures 2018. And uh, sure enough, my portion was Revelation chapter 14. So uh, in that book, I actually have a full exegesis of Revelation chapter 14 and the way that uh, I had come to understand it in line with, obviously, chapters 1 through uh, chapter 21. Uh, so what really, what Ivan, and again, I, I, I believe you'd agree with this, Ivan, last night, Ivan wasn't dealing with all three of those angels by any means. Uh, really, he was focusing on that first angel there, uh, or no, matter of fact, the first and the second angel uh, because you see the gospel being declared, the judgment, the, the, the cause to fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And then uh, the declaration that Babylon was going, that Babylon was falling. And uh, so the two. Yeah, the second angel, actually. OK, so that was the focus. And then uh, I'm going to give you some time here. I hope you'll jump in and chime in. But I know you're also preparing a future presentation yeah. uh, in regards to that third angel there, the, the Mark of the Beast, correct? Yes, yes. That's right, right, Pastor. I'm sorry? I was saying, that's right, Pastor. It's going okay. to be presented at Patchogue on the September September 25th. Okay, cool. We'll remember that, Edward. Uh, we're going to try to remember to uh, say that at the end with the resources yeah. and announcements that we want to bring up at the end as well. So, um, Ivan, how do you feel about the things I've been saying so far? Does it sound like we're... Good. We're in agreement, yes, right? Yes. Up, up until this point, we're in agreement <laughs> and we're, we're saying, yeah. you know, a lot of the same things, because again, yeah. that's why I was able to say to you, I appreciated that, you know, the outline, the history, the context. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I had learned from talking through with many people in the study group there, that's one of the blessings of gathering there in that group is that yeah. you, you dive deeper into the context and actually want to learn what the scriptures have to say. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise so, God. So now, uh, Edward, if you don't mind, we're going to jump over to Revelation 17, because this is going to give us a bit more context uh, as we're talking about Babylon, This uh, the declaration here of this second angel. Mm -hmm. And here in Revelation, I'm just going to kind of jump in and start reading. It says, of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on the many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adultery, adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls, she held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Then I saw, when I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names who have been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast. 
because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind of wisdom. The seven heads are, are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also the seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seventh and is going to destruction. And I'm not going to continue reading through all the uh, kings, but I want to just jump down to verse 15. Uh, the angel said to me, the waters you saw, this is something you were alluding to, Edward, where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Now, uh, I'm going to stop there because, again, we could go on to chapter 18 and 19, uh, which we're going to allude to here in a moment. Uh, however, uh, this is just showing you a preface here to an introduction to Babylon. Mm -hmm. And Edward, did anything stand out before I continue? I don't want to keep uh, just yapping and not give you opportunity to jump in here. So please, uh, was there anything that you felt needed to be made mention there? Okay, is this is still talking about the same woman. Yes. Okay, that runs uh, over the kings of the earth that you just read in 18 is also referred to um, the harlot that sits or the people that sits, you know, uh, uh, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples. So she's like over the peoples. She's in that authority. That's why she's, she's wearing the purple and all of that because that signifies authority, the purple. Um, and um, um, it is, it's quite obvious uh, who the mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and the, of the abominations of the earth, that that's still speaking of the woman that sits on the beast in Scarlet. I just wanted to, you know, highlight that. You know, I appreciate you bringing that up because Ivan, I know that you had brought that up, something similar to that in your presentation last night where you, you brought up a, an interesting correlation. Um, it was that you were talking about the color that was offered to the one that uh, would discern the dream of Belshazzar. And uh, then you also, when we, we went to Revelation, we saw very similarly that color uh, mentioned there. Uh, would you agree with uh, what Edward had said about it being a signification of royalty? You're muted for some reason. I'm sorry. There you are. Yes. Uh, so I do agree with what Edward mentioned. It's a sign of royalty. And uh, we saw in Daniel 5, Belshazzar said he would um, cover whoever, um, you know, explains the, uh, the letters on the wall and the interpretation. Uh, he would uh, give them a scarlet robe and a purple robe. We see those two colors mentioned here in Revelation as well, Amen. in reference to Babylon. Right, absolutely. And, um, you know, I have to say, Ivan, one of the things that you also got me thinking about last night that I rather appreciated was talking about the finger of God and wherein you see in Daniel 5 how the finger of God is marking out that, that prophecy there on the wall. And then obviously, if you, you do your studying and you know, you know, a biblical, uh, you have a biblical mind, you can say, well, this brings me back to the, the Ten Commandments, the giving of the law to Moses. This also projects my mind to what I appreciated you bringing up was uh, Jesus writing in the sand. Yeah. Uh, that was, I thought that was a pretty neat, uh, something I had marked down in my own studies to say, I want to further look into that and see the, you know, the significance and the correlation there. So uh, jumping right in here to talk about Babylon, what Ivan had done was marked out a, um, a sort of, and what I had done in my notes, at least, was created a sort of chart of what we would require of this Babylon, right? Who is this Babylon? That's a book, matter of fact, by a teacher that I enjoy, uh, Dr. Don K. Preston, uh, he wrote a book called Who is This Babylon? So um, a couple of things that were brought up. The first thing was here in verse five of uh, Revelation chapter seven. We see that this Babylon is a mother, a woman. And a mother I thought was interesting because then the, the discussion later on led into talking about the daughters of Babylon. So I thought that was an interesting correlation there. So it's a woman. And I... Uh, the verse that was brought up was uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, 
where we read, obviously, the Apostle Paul referring to the church as the chaste virgin uh, that was waiting for her groom, Christ, and, and to be married to. Uh, and there's quite a few other allusions in the New Testament that kind of point to that uh, picture there of the church being the bride and Christ being the groom. Uh, one thing that was brought up was that this woman, uh, when you read about a woman in scripture, that you read about the church, which I agreed with. However, my mind in this discussion automatically went over to Matthew 23, where Jesus Christ refers to Jerusalem as a sheep, uh, that she stoned the prophets that were sent to her. So right away, my mind went to that, that type of picture there. And I said, well, there's, oh, she was a woman too, the, the city of Jerusalem. Then the next reference was obviously Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, where Babylon is a city. And uh, the, Babylon is a city that has made the nations drink of her adulteries. She's a city that has drunk of this wine that we mentioned before. Uh, and this wine has inc incurred the wrath of God. This wine is a mixture of the wrath of God and fornication and spiritual fornication, of course, uh, mixing. I appreciated the understanding last night being brought forth that um, unholy would be, or uh, yeah, fornications would be the mixing of holy and unholy. And I thought that was a, a interesting a way of defining that, which again, I agree with. So that's what this city is doing. She's making the nations drink. She's uh, She's drinking of this wine that's incurring the wrath of God and is filled with fornication. And uh, then Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 was brought up that she's surrounded by water, right? Because you see the, that the waters would dry up and that's what would cause the kings of the east to come in and invade. Uh, and then the last point was, that I wrote down, at least, was the seven heads and seven that are the seven kings, et cetera, the seven mountains. Uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. And uh, so these were the things that were marked out. And uh, what, what was posited, and Edward, you, me and you went over this uh, a little bit earlier, so I'm interested to hear. I don't know that I, I got much of your thoughts on this, but what was posited was, well, this is Vatican City. Because Vatican City obviously is a church, a uh, Roman Catholic church. Uh, then you have, it's a city, which I, again, I thought that was an interesting point there. Uh, then the, we see this city uh, making the nation's drink. And uh, there was an allusion to uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, obviously being a Catholic and uh, participating in that and, and the influence of Catholicism, if you will, uh, worldwide. Uh, then, or Roman Catholicism, Ivan, I appreciated the distinction in that regard. And uh, then Again, uh, Vatican City is surrounded by a uh, body of water, uh, surrounded by, uh, and it is, and again, in history, in Western history, which I think is important to make mention, in Western history, Rome has been noted as the city on seven hills. So uh, this seemed to be, uh, and again, this is where Vatican City is. So this is where, uh, so Edward, what are your thoughts? So what, what comes to mind? What comes to mind basically is that uh, the Vatican City and things of this nature, right? Although they fit the paradigm of what scripture is saying, in many areas, paradigms fit. Like you have futures today talking about the abomination of desolation, the falling away and all of these various things, which are true. But the distinction is the first century. Because in the first century, all things were to be fulfilled, according to Jesus in every jot and tittle, you know, that was to be fulfilled. And anyway, basically, um, what I have here in Matthew uh, 23, 37 through 39, I have, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Okay, now. When it says something twice, it's giving you an indication that this is very, very crucial. And it's naming Jerusalem as the ones that killed the prophets and stoned those who were sent to her. And he's referring to Jerusalem as her, you know. And then I got, you know, in Revelations 1 through 6, the judgment of the great hearted who sits, you know. And, okay, I don't know if. If, if Ivan would correlate Revelation 17 with Matthew 23, but I, I correlate them as 
um, Jerusalem being nicknamed the great harlot that sat on the beast, um, the, uh, the, the mystery Babylon that we had read uh, just recently in, uh, what was it? Oh, just in 17, mystery. Yeah. Revelation seven, well, Revelation 14 and 17 so far. Yes. So that committed, you know, the, the, the adultery with the inhabitants of the earth were drunk with the wine of her fornication, of her fornication, her referring to Jerusalem, and the fornication is the idolatrous behaviors that uh, caused the nations around them to, uh, and Jerusalem to uh, indulge in. You know, that idolatry, that's what was making God, God so angry is because, you know, they knew better. They had the oracles, you know, the, the, the people of Jerusalem, the Jewish people, you know. And I also put, uh, I have to jump to on top here. I have in Matthew 23, like one through four, uh, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat to observe whatever they tell you. So in other words, um, after Moses, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees or whoever that sat in the seat of Moses, they sat in authority and they're, and they're telling the people basically like what to do and things of this nature. And by them doing so, they negated a lot of, of the message of Christ and, and observing, you know, things that were passing. And as a result, let me see, um, in Matthew 23, 13 through 36, you know, the correction, the correcting of the scribes and Pharisees, having cleansed outside of the cup dish, but inside they were all exhorting and self-indulgence, you know, and then 37, 39, I got the old Jerusalem, old Jerusalem, you know, and, and it's referring to those, you know, that, you know, had the authority, but they used it, you know, in idolatrous manners, like I, idolizing the law, which can be somewhat understood, you know, because the law was prevalent at that particular time before Christ, but to idolize it to where, as you know, when the Messiah that fulfilled, everything was right in front of them and they could not see, you know, because, you know, they idolized, you know, that law, you know, and then the finger of God um, doing the 10 commandments, mm -hmm. you know, and putting it in the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the danger was idolizing those tablets instead of actually what God would have to do, the obedience and things of this nature. You know, they would idolize, you know, things, you know, that God has done and maybe have said in a sense, you know, they would idolize certain objects instead of the God that made these objects or the God that, you know, wrote these uh, laws or whatever, you know. They, they, they have a tendency of idolizing things instead of the, the creator that created these things. You know, that's basically what I have to say. I have a tendency of rambling, but you know, I'm sorry about that. Well, hey, that's uh, brother, I'm, I'm appreciating you and I'm sure uh, anybody listening is appreciating you, what you have to say as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Ivan, did you have anything you wanted to mark out there? Did you want to say, or did, you know, again, I just want to afford you the opportunity to speak. Sure, um, I was just wondering, um, Brother Edward, uh, yeah. with regards to Matthew 23, towards the end, uh, mm -hmm. the Bible tells us about Jerusalem, or Jesus tells us about Jerusalem, yeah. who, who killed the, kills the prophets, right? Yeah. Uh, just mm -hmm. two questions. One, in Matthew 24, mm -hmm. Matthew 24, verse 3, it reads, Now, as Jesus sat mm -hmm. on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying tell us when these things be and mm -hmm. what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age mm -hmm. so <clears throat> in this chapter jesus mm -hmm. mentions about the fall of jerusalem which happened in yes. uh, AD 70 or 70 AD. Yes. But also, the, it has a dual meaning. One, mm -hmm. the actual fulfillment, which as we both know, we all know, historically, this prophecy came to pass, AD 70, uh, the Romans uh, besieged uh, Jerusalem and they destroyed the, the temple, exactly yes. as Christ prophesied, that not one stone will be left on top of another. 
Yes. <clears throat> With the same token, the question that uh, the disciples asked Christ was, they had two questions in verse 3. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay. So if Jerusalem has already been destroyed, and the temple including, in AD 70, so what is the sign of his coming and of the end of the age? Because obviously we, the world is not ended yet. Yes, to my understanding, the end of the age was the age of the old covenant, the old covenantal system, which was of the law of sacrifice and things of this nature. When the, when the temple and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, they had no, no place to uh, make sacrifices and things of that nature. Um, that was their world. That was, you know, what they considered their world, you know, and um, that was the end of that age in 70, the year 70, to whereas now we're in the new covenant, the new age, you know, and see basically what we were able to see, this is the distinction, what we were able to see physically was the temple being destroyed, the city being destroyed, Okay, and being that we were able to see that, we were able to see the unseen if you were watching through your eyes of the, prof of the prophecies that were being stated as far as the dead ones being raised, the sleep being gathered, the awake uh, being changed, you know, from one mind of the old covenant being changed to the new mind and to the new covenant, which has no end. So... That's how I view that. Okay, got it. And I, I just want to mention that, uh, uh, you know, this is the first time I'm having a dialogue with, uh, you know, uh, 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 brothers who believe in uh, preterism. Um, so I'm just learning from you guys as well as to what you guys believe. I'm very open-minded. And that's why I asked this question. Can I ask a second question now? Or did you want to say something in, before that, Pastor? No, hey, please continue. Okay, so again, uh, Brother Edward, how do we then understand Revelation chapter 17, um, verse 3, <clears throat> excuse me, Revelation chapter 17, verse 3, and I'll read it, verse 3 tells us, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So if we say the woman is Jerusalem city, mm -hmm. then who is the scarlet beast that Jerusalem city is sitting upon? And how is the color purple and scarlet connected to Jerusalem city? And also the same text tells us that... <clears throat> um, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication and all, and, and also um, regarding the same uh, Babylon, Babylon, um, verse 16, the Bible tells us, and the 10 horns which you saw on the beast, these will hit the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So then, I'm so sorry. Let's let's read verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind. These are of one mind. And they will give their power and authority to the beast. They These will make war with the lamb. And the lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So how does Jerusalem fit into this? If okay. we say Babylon city is Jerusalem city. Excellent. Okay, what I see in verse 3. Um, so he carried them away in the spirit into the wilderness. There was a custom back at that time in first century to go into the wilderness to reflect you know, to, to, to hear from God, away from all the noise and negativity in, in the cities or wherever they were located. You know, they would always go to the, 
to the desert, you know, for the or wilderness, you know, to hear from God. Okay. And when he saw the woman that sat, let me see, the scarlet, uh, and he saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. This is his vision, I would assume, that he's receiving from God. That was full of the names of blasphemy, who even uh, having seven heads and ten horns. So the beast that, that they sat on, I, it would have to, it seems as though it would have to be Rome. Because Rome was the one that the Pharisees had, and uh, the Pharisees had kind of hooked up with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or the or the what was the other or the scribes, the scribes and Pharisees kind of uh, hooked up with, so they could uh, persecute the uh, the Christians, you know. So I see that there, and um, if I may, may I jump in there? Uh, one thing I, I would I would add to this uh, is that in Scripture, the only people that I find Christ. Uh, saying something that includes both blasphemy and abomination uh, would be the Pharisees when they began to deny the very work of Christ, of God, happening in front of them. Uh, we all know that text that's often alluded to there where, you, you know, no, no sin would be uh, forgiven of you, uh, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which is this abomination. Uh, so in the first century, what we see happening, the religious system based in Jerusalem uh, was this blasphemous group of people that were defying the very work of Christ that was in front of them. And Ivan, if I may, uh, I'll say that I know you agree with that because yeah, as you marked out before, uh, you see the dual fulfillment. So you see uh, how, you know, this might be something akin to what we would refer to in our community as partial preterism, where you see part of the fulfillment in the first century and then later on, obviously, you're still waiting for a yet future uh, fulfillment of these things. Uh, for us, a lot, obviously, the biggest issue is that we don't see that detachment. And um, Edward and I uh, earlier today, as we were talking through this, one of the things we did mark out right from the very beginning, and I'm sorry to just jump in on the discussion, but I wanted to mark it out, was that um, we see a distinction in our hermeneutics, you, you know, what, how we're going about interpreting these things. So um, I just kind of wanted to jump in there because what I see is when John is having this vision uh, that Edward was marking out there, uh, he's seeing a, a, a blasphemous woman, right? This woman's the one that has the blasphemy on her head. That's who Christ came to rebuke. That's why Christ says, I came to none other than the house of Israel. Uh, so he was rebuking the, the scribes and the Pharisees in that first century time, calling them blasphemers because they had, uh, as I read in my Mark reading earlier today, that they had... Uh, invalidated the word of God by their traditions. Uh, I believe that's Mark 7. And um, so that's the idolatry that I see taking place in the first century and this uh, the, the blasphemy. And uh, if I may just kind of just continue here, um, one of the things that I think Edward was marking out uh, from Matthew 23 uh, and here that we see right in this text in verse 6 is that it was Jerusalem that Christ accused of uh, persecuting the, the, the prophets. And sure enough, here, this woman is drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore the testimony to Jesus. When we take all of that into consideration, I believe that begins to answer our question. And again, I will say, uh, this is an hour-long program. I don't know that we're going to get into the ten horns and seven heads, and uh, that's a lot of stuff there. Uh, however, uh, for me, what I see happening here is, if we're taking in the first century scene, uh, you have Jerusalem, which was the city that was supposed to have the knowledge of God. Uh, that's where I think that royalty picture is coming in there. And they're riding on the back of a beast, which is, you, you know, Rome uh, and their wickedness there. And neither one of them, as we often mark out in our teachings, the Romans in the first century and the Jews in the first century, neither one of them could have persecuted the Christians the way they wanted to without each other. For example, the Jews didn't have that brute and force uh, that they wanted to see happen to the Christian community, whereas the Romans really wouldn't have cared much about the, the Christian community uh, other than the Jews being the instigators, uh, as we see often in movies, et cetera, uh, the Jews being the instigators of the issue. So that's why for, in my estimation, I see a lot of this, uh, a, a lot of this language uh, talking about that Roman Jewish collusion or collision, if you will, in the first century and how they were working against the church. So uh, again, so I'm sorry I jumped in there. Um, okay. but I, I wanted to continue. I know uh, Edward, you we were on verse. You were responding a bit 
to uh, verse three, uh, you're talking about the blasphemous names and the seven heads and 10 horns. And again, uh, I don't know where you stand in your study, Edward, uh, on a very honest, transparent uh, perspective. I sit here and I say, I have no idea. Uh, that's something, that's a text that I think you need to exegete and kind of uh, do some historical uh, background to understand what it might even be talking about there. Yes, true. So I cut you off, Edward. So I wanted to continue, if you wanted to continue, I know you were responding. <laughs> To what Ivan had asked you there about how you see, yeah, I knew there would there would come a point where I needed to stand corrected. Um, I saw a woman sitting on the Scarlet Beach with full of names of blasphemy. Uh, we know that's the the uh, uh, let me see uh, having the name of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Okay, there's seven heads and ten horns. You know, I think that goes you would have to go down further, which I believe Ivan had already alluded to in verse 15 uh, through uh, verse 16. I believe I- Yeah, 16. I, oh, verse 16? Yes, sir. Okay, and the 10 horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and, make, and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So we know in eight, in 70, in the year 70, what had occurred, you know, um, I, I don't know. Like, like Pastor said, I have to say, I don't know. No problem. I, not a pro no, that's okay. No problem, uh, Brother Edward. I really, really appreciate you uh, and Pastor Michael, of course. So I'm very, very happy that I met Pastor Michael uh, because he was so humble last night and we had a great connection except for my PowerPoint connection <laughs> last night and he was very patient. So uh, if we, again, a question for us to think, just a question for all of us to think. Yeah. If we say Babylon was Jerusalem city, um, then how, how, how did Jerusalem city um, had so much power over the kings of the earth? Verse 2. Let me read from verse 1, and I'll read verse 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth, it's a worldwide power mm -hmm. means. So the kings of the earth. The politicians have committed fornication and the inhabitants, not just the politicians, but even the general public, the population of the mm. earth were made drunk with the wine. As uh, I mentioned uh, last night, a wine represents false gospel, drunk with the wine of our fornication. Mm. So how do we then, again, this is a question for us to think, did Jerusalem or does Jerusalem have the power to promote false gospel because Jerusalem does not believe in gospel or gospel at all. They don't believe in Christ as a savior, right? So we, that's some, some, something we had to think of if we I say Jerusalem like, is a bad one. I would like Pastor to correct me if I'm wrong because he is my pastor and I'm learning. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm learning my, too, so go ahead. <laughs> my, um, uh, when, you, when you see the word earth, Sometimes, depending upon context, earth refers to God's people. Yeah. Okay. Many of them. Okay. And you spoke further about, um, what did you say? Uh, what was the topic about uh, that you were describing? Uh, you said something about the earth and then you went on. In verses yes. of was one second. and two. Yeah, one and two. Revelation 17 was one oh. and two. One and two. Okay. Yeah. So the judgment of the great all of sits on the water and the kings of the earth. Okay. <clears throat> the kings of the earth, the inhabitants of okay. I I don't know. I don't want to make it ex, you know, insert something that's not there. But I'm thinking Pharisees, uh, being that they were leadership of the Jewish people, the, the Juda Judaizers, the ones that were persecuting the Christians. Um, 
they like I said, they weren't they could they had not the authority to to uh, execute certain of the people or however without the Romans being supported. Yeah. So that's basically what I see in that regard. Pastor would have okay. to take over and you know. <laughs> If I may, if I may jump in there, and again, one of the things we do here, Ivan, uh, at the end of our session is we usually bring up a lot of resources because, again, our goal is not to be know-it-alls, but in instead, and I appreciate that you marked out a couple questions for uh, people to study through. I think you've highlighted some good points that I think uh, need response. Now, uh, this text here in the in uh, verses one through two here, talking about the the lofty title, right, if you will, the lofty titles given to Jerusalem. Uh, that's what I would refer to it as. And I actually, uh, the reason why I said all of that is uh, if you have any resources you want us to uh, consider, please let us know. For me, one of the resources I'm going to be mentioning uh, in our, our update when we podcast this program is a, uh, a link that I have at bible.org. And sure enough, I just want to read to you a little bit of commentary from it. It says, a second difficulty with the Jerusalem view, again, this is the view of Jerusalem in contrast to the more often than not assertion of Rome uh, being the, uh, the Babylon uh, that we read about, a difficulty with the Jerusalem view for some is the lofty language used by the author of Revelation to describe the city of Babylon, especially in verse 18, where we see, uh, you know, even more uh, further, you know, the great city which had dominion over the kings of the earth. And just to offer a sort of response, um, from a sheer political standpoint, uh, this seems to be straightforward Rome. Uh, who else had dominion over the kings of the earth? Can this be said of Jerusalem in any sense? Certainly. This is one of the more problematic issues for the Jerusalem view, but a case can be made for this sort of language that is not, not out of line in a context such as this. There is, in fact, a fairly substantial precedent for similar, similar hyperbolic language for the exaltation of the city of Jerusalem. For instance, Psalm 48, verse 2, Jerusalem is said to be the exaltation of all the earth because it is the city of the great king. Uh, the language is hyperbolic. Uh, speaking of Zion, of course. Uh, so that's just one scriptural reference. But I do believe that uh, also Jesus Christ, uh, for example, uh, when he gives parables, he talks about the rich man. And when he's speaking about the rich man, I believe those parables bear out that he's actually contrasting the Pharisees who were arrogant in the riches of God. And uh, he's contrasting that with the humble of spirit that had the ears to hear and the eyes to see uh, in that time. So uh, when I hear the riches there and the influence of these people, I'm thinking of uh, Jerusalem in its spiritual sense, which again, I agree with you that Jerusalem did not have the gospel. Uh, however, I believe that Jerusalem had the law, which the law had a power to it, and uh, that gave them, uh, you know, identity as the people of God. They were to be the light to the nations under the law of Moses, uh, but they unfortunately did not, and all it did, as the Apostle Paul said, was magnify their sin. So, uh, to me, that's where that response, uh, you know, I believe that it can be a sufficient response uh, and needs to be further dug out uh, as far as can we find in scripture where Jerusalem is exalted to be this, this city that has influence over the nations? I do believe that that would, uh, again, Psalm. Maybe in verse, uh, rather chapter 18 of Revelation, um, where it talks about the merchants and all of, you know, the wealth of the luxuries and things of this nature. I have it, you know, read it in, in a summary. May I share? Sure. Please. Okay. I have Revelation 18, right? Two through three, eight, 10, 16 through 17, and 19. Okay, and, and I, you know, I condensed it. I have the fall of Babylon, the great, fall of Babylon the great. And then in verse three, all the nations have drunk of the wine of, of the wrath of her, fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through her abundance of her luxury. Verse eight, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. The strong is, yeah, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Now, uh, verse eight kind of correlates with um, the woman being burned in um, 16 of 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correlates. 
And then I have in Revelation 19, 2, for the righteous of his judgments, because of his judge, because he has judged the great harlot was corrupt, who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. She uh, uh, the blood of his servants shed by her. Yeah. So that's basically all I have. Well, if I may, I just wanted to jump in there. Another uh, thing that I'm glad Edward mentioned is um, the, the setting of the city on fire. Uh, again, Jesus offers plenty of parables against the religious elite there in Jerusalem and tells them about how their city will be left on fire. Obviously, we alluded to Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 3 before, uh, you know, in regards to the city being set on fire and, um, you know, the temple being destroyed for that matter. And uh, history does bear that this happened. This was this 40 years after these prophecies were uttered by Christ and written by the apostles. Uh, it did happen uh, in that city. So uh, obviously, uh, one thing that I and Ivan, what I want to do here in a moment, because we're obviously getting to the end of our hour, is I want to give you a moment to kind of challenge us. Uh, you've already brought up some good points that I believe uh, it would be important for myself and Edward and anybody listening to go back and review and uh, ask ourselves, you know, how we would respond to these points. And I want to encourage you uh, here in a moment, uh, if you would be interested in just kind of sharing with us a last exhortation to kind of challenge our study in this regard, as we've been talking about the fall of Babylon. So uh, for me, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I believe that we've marked out some interesting points. Uh, I believe that uh, from my estimation, Jerusalem does fit the bill as this exalted city uh, that rode on the back of the beast of Rome in the first century, persecuted the saints, uh, was a city, uh, was a woman, as we marked out from Matthew 23, uh, did uh, drink the wine of God's wrath and fornication, which again, I mentioned the Pharisees being rebuked by Jesus again and again for their traditions in validating the word of God. And then um, we did not deal very much with Jerusalem being surrounded by water, but I believe that might be evident for anybody that looks at a map, uh, the, you know, that it's surrounded by a body of water. And uh, also I had mentioned a bit of uh, willingness to further study through the reference to the seven heads and seven mountains uh, mentioned there. Um, yeah. So that's me, uh, Edward, did I sum it up good? And, and then I want to pass it over to Ivan to kind of share with us a last exhortation. Amen. All right. All right. So the other question that we had to think uh, or ask ourselves is from verse nine of Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse nine, the Bible tells us, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. If we say Jerusalem city, is Jerusalem city located on seven mountains? So that's something that uh, we had a we had a question as well. Yeah, that, that's what I'm willing to say. Uh, however, uh, and I don't know how you would respond to this, Ivan. Um, I've noticed a couple of different views of this where this may not be talking about actual seven hills, because again, I did reference at the beginning that I know Jerusalem through Western history, Eastern history, it's kind of tricky to think that the East, uh, I don't think there's any notation of the East calling Rome, uh, um, you know, the city on seven hills. I know Western literature had uh, in ancient times. Uh, so what would you say to those that might think this is more of a metaphoric phrase uh, rather than a literal uh, understanding? Vatican calls itself as a city of seven hills. They actually give the tour of the seven hills on which Vatican is located. Okay. Uh, I can send you the link later on, uh, okay. the tour guide um, for you know the seven hills. Okay. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I'm looking at the time. And um, if... If it is possible, if it is okay, I would love to have a study on the subject, uh, Babylon, oh, sorry, Jerusalem as Babylon or Vatican as Babylon. And uh, we can look through facts, history, Bible texts, and we can come to a conclusion. Amen. That'd be great. I think, you know, what we would do is obviously set it up for far more than maybe a, an hour session. We sure. might have something longer. We could do it in person, online, however we so uh, choose yeah. and feel edified. So Ivan, you know, I appreciate you. And I thank you for uh, sharing with us some of these things. I think thank you've you. given, uh, if in the very least, you've given all of us uh, the challenge to go back to Daniel 5, go back to Revelation, and really kind of dig through and ask ourselves, how would I respond? If I believe what I'm saying, 
how would I respond to some of the points that were being brought up? So uh, I appreciate what you've marked out for us. I hope, uh, as Edward said, that you won't be a stranger. And uh, amen, we'll amen. Touch. Thank you, brother Edward. <laughs> yes, it's wonderful having you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Well, th uh, thank you. Now we're going to go ahead and close out. Ivan, you're more than welcome to stay a part of our session. Oh, sure. uh, we're just going to go ahead and start closing out our session tonight. Um, sure. Edward, you know. I have to say we didn't get into the uh, end times portion that I had desired, but I know we're up against the time there. Uh, maybe that's something that we'll have a discussion with Ivan about uh, in another future time. Maybe take a look at a verse that he had mentioned last night was Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, uh, wherein we read that the gospel will be preached to all the nations and, and then, or some translations say in all the world, and then the end will come. Uh, again, we'll talk about that another time. I want to mark that out for a future discussion. That way we can definitely lock Ivan in that he has to come back and, uh, you know, join with us for these discussions. So, um, Edward, you know, as well as I do, that a, a big part of our distinction in understanding uh, often comes from what we would call hermeneutics, uh, proper Bible interpretational uh, methods. And uh, for me, uh, something that stands out that we always need to highlight is context. Now, when I say context, I don't mean read five verses above, five verses below. I mean, we actually need to understand what the, the message is, what's going on in the fullness of the letter. We need to understand who's writing it, when they're writing it, why they're writing it, to who they're writing it to. Uh, and ultimately some of the, the, the social situations that are going on. We need to understand these background details. So uh, more often than not, our, our understanding leads us to think that uh, people are not dealing with the context of the, the first century uh, where Christ and his disciples uh, were there and dealing with. So um, obviously uh, another aspect of hermeneutics that we would often bring up is audience relevance. You know, how this would, when Jesus Christ is standing in front, or for that matter, when John is writing this letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor, uh, we need to understand what were their immediate concerns? What were their issues that they were thinking about? Um, obviously, uh, you know that as preterists, we would disagree that they were thinking about the Vatican City. Um, they, you know, we would say that they, there is no way that that was even in their mind at that time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a progression of uh, an influence that was there. Matter of fact, at the end of the study last night, uh, there was someone there that had mentioned the leaven of the Pharisees. And that, that provoked me and, and stuck with me because uh, for me, the problem then and the problem today is the leaven of the Pharisees. It's that, that wickedness that pervades men's hearts to give them that hubris that I brought up at the beginning. And Edward, I know I've stole that word from you because you, were, you highlighted it in the video. Uh, and then I just kind of ran with it because it spoke to me because I believe that the biggest problem with man is the arrogance in man's heart. Man deciding that he could lean upon his own understanding, man deciding that he's going to do what is right in his own eyes, uh, as we see uh, the continued problem uh, all throughout the biblical narrative. And, and that also makes me want to mention, uh, and I'll stop here, Edward, and give you a moment to uh, jump in. Uh, that makes me want to mention also, as you know, I often highlight the biblical narrative as that apologetic that we must have, that um, the context that we must develop. In other words, uh, when we understand what the Bible is talking about from Genesis to Revelation, when we go through it and we develop a narrative of what actually is going on here in this story, what was God bestowing upon uh, his people to know about him and his relationship to them? And when we begin to put together that biblical narrative, uh, it allows for us to take in different teachings and ask ourselves, well, how does that square away with what I've developed and what I've understood as the biblical narrative? So uh, for me, those are some of the things that stand out. Uh, Edward, I wanted to give you a moment to respond to some of the things that were shared tonight, and then we'll move into uh, mentioning some resources and announcements. Amen. I kind of wanted to go back to um, verse 9 of 17, where it says the, the heads, uh, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the women sat. I have mountains. And uh, mountains, if you were to look up mountains throughout the scripture, you know, mountains many in many cases means uh, people in authority, you know, so I'm, and then if you were to go to verse 10, it says, there are also seven kings. So that might be that correlation of the seven heads being the seven kings. I'm just stating that, you know, according to um, some things in scripture that pertain to mountains, they refer to like kings or people in authority. So I just wanted to highlight that so food for thought. Food for thought. Amen. 
And the word um, that we were just talking about hubris is excessive pride or self-confidence. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And again, um, obviously, we've seen that very clearly in, in the first century uh, world there, uh, where the Pharisees had, the, again, Jesus called it the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, that was their, their hubris in that first century. Amen. All right. Well, uh, unless you have anything else you want to share, Edward, I'll just kind of jump into sharing some thoughts, resources, and announcements. That's cool. I would just like to say thank you, Ivan. Hope to see you again. It's My as pleasure. Much as you know, it's been a wonderful experience, and you've given us food for thought, things to think about, scripture to uh, uh, learn further. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Edward. And again, thank you for having me. And uh, it was a pleasure to uh, have a dialogue with you guys. It is really nice experience. Thank Amen. you. We're glad to hear that, brother. Um, now, uh, what I did want to make mention of is uh, Ivan had mentioned a presentation that he's going to be uh, doing uh, in regards to the Mark of the Beast. I could actually do something fancy and throw it up here on the screen for those of you that are viewing. Um, here it will be at the, uh, I believe that's the Seven Day Adventist yes. Church there Patch on North Division Avenue. Yeah, Patchogue Seven Day Adventist Church. That's right. Okay, great. Saturday, September twenty fifth, three p.m. to six p.m. Yeah, I, so I'm marking it down in my calendar, so uh, I'll be excited to be there. I look forward to seeing some people that may be tuned into our program this evening. Nice. And, and uh, also, please feel free to. Sorry, I just want to mention that uh, you can invite even if you have Muslim friends, please invite them also. This presentation is for everybody: Jews, Muslims, Hindus. Everybody should uh, are invited for this presentation. Thank you. I'm yes. thankful you had mentioned that because I would like to also attend, you know, <laughs> a company pastor, possibly, you know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So that's one resource uh, for future study and for future reference. And um, what I'll obviously make mention of uh, a couple of resources for me that came to mind as I was planning, uh, listening to Ivan last night, and also uh, as I was planning out our program today. The first one is a book I already mentioned by Dr. Don K. Preston. Who is this Babylon? Uh, he deals with a lot of what, if not everything that we mentioned here in this discussion uh, in that book. Uh, so I encourage you to get your hands on a copy of that. Uh, also, I mentioned my, uh, my part in the Spirit and Life Lectures 2018, a book that you could get on Amazon. Uh, you could also order through me. Uh, and this is a book where I offered up a commentary on Revelation chapter 14. However, the book includes a, a commentary throughout the entire uh, book of Revelation uh, from the preterist standpoint, of course. And then I also mentioned uh, my resource that I've put together, Clarity and Revelation, a teaching uh, series through uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, and then uh, some links I'm going to be sharing uh, in our update for this week. What you do is you visit powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. You can access the blog through powerofpreterism.com, but it's easier just to tell you about the WordPress link. So when you go there, you'll be able to read all of our different updates. Each week, I offer an update in regards to the Preterist Power Hour and the links that we mentioned and resources that we mentioned. So everything that I've mentioned here will be listed on that blog. Uh, also, a link to revelationrevolution.org, their commentary on Revelation chapter 17, Daniel Marias actually was a speaker at one of our conferences here through video at the Blue Point Bible Church a couple of years ago. So uh, we want to encourage you to go ahead and visit his link. Uh, then also, I'm going to be sharing a link that I read a little bit from this evening from Bible ORG, uh, where they have an article titled Chapter 4, The Evidence for Jerusalem as the Harlot. And uh, I'll share that link with you as well. So uh, you'll find a link to this video. You'll find all of those resources and more, and we'll look forward to continued conversation in these regards. One last resource I might make mention of that I was excited about, you would imagine as the director of a preterist network, anytime I find a new link uh, to new preterist resources, I'm always excited. So uh, one that I found this week was a, a, pay, a website called preteristpapers.com. And uh, this is a resource where you could read different articles that were put forth. I'm not sure who directs the uh, the, the link there. However, uh, some of the articles that I had previously read, I was very much edified by. And lastly, I'll make reference of a new resource that's popped up. Uh, Alan Morton, Preterist Voice, put forth fulfilledmedia.com. So uh, these are all resources that you could get your hands on. And lastly, before I offer up a moment of prayer, I would like to go ahead and share with you the graphic for our upcoming conference here at the Blue Point Bible Church, October 8th through the 10th. 
We have a variety of speakers traveling out to join with us. Uh, throw, go ahead and throw it up on the screen for you. Here we have uh, not, uh, what is it? Uh, not one stone left, obviously based upon a verse that we read this evening, Matthew chapter 24, verse three. Uh, we'll have a variety of speakers. We're gonna have in-depth teachings and fellowship. Uh, many of you, uh, you could visit the bluepointbiblechurch.org and you click on the tab that says not one stone left and you'll read through uh, a bunch of different details for those that are traveling. We have hotel discounts available and uh, also um, some of the speakers, you know, we have Ward Fenley visiting from California. We have Glenn Hill visiting from North Carolina. We have uh, Pastor Daniel Rogers visiting from Alabama. And we have TJ Smith offering a video who's from Texas, and then also a video from Africa, uh, all about the influence of uh, a fulfilled eschatology and how uh, not one stone left, uh, understanding what that points to has left them restored and complete. So Edward, did I offer up enough announcements and uh, resources for you, or do you have something you want to add? Amen. You did great. <laughs> All right. Good deal. Well, I thank each of you, Ivan. Again, I thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be here each and every Thursday night, 6.30 p.m. Uh, we offer up this program. It's available on YouTube. It's available through the Power of Preterism Network's Facebook page. And of course, you could zoom in, call in and be a part of our session at any time. There was one thing I did want to mention that I was thinking about prior to us having this program was that you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes and the Zealots. They all had different views, but they all considered themselves Jews. So that's a wonderful thing. You know, we can have little differences, but yet, you know, we're all still brothers in Christ. Amen. Amen. Well said, <laughs> brother. I appreciate that. Please join me in a moment of prayer as I close out our session tonight. Mighty God, we do thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to fellowship through uh, the technology that you have so sovereignly and providentially uh, allowed us to uh, be a part of and to develop in our society today. Lord, we thank you for the conversation put forth. We thank you for the spirit of humility that causes us, Lord, to learn, ever learn how to disagree well, and uh, even areas where it's not even about disagreement, but are about seeking, searching, studying, and proving, Lord, the things of God. So we thank you that we cleave to you, we cleave to your word, that we desire to be like the noble Bereans who searched the scriptures to see if what they were hearing was true. And of course, Lord, we ask that you continue to help us see that you have given everything to us pertaining to life and godliness. May we exalt you all the more. May we continue to see the possession and increase in our lives that give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being a part of the session tonight. Go in peace. Amen. God bless. Amen.